Hey everyone, Ivan here, and in this video we'll start training Yellow V5 on a custom dataset. The goal of this video is to take the dataset that we have collected, train a custom Yellow V5 model on it using PyTorch, and then deploy a custom trained model locally on a system like Windows. You're watching part 3 of the Yellow V5 series. Watch part 0 to learn more about the YOLO V5 and weights and biases integration, part 1 to learn how to install YOLO V5 on Windows and Google Colab, and part 2 to learn about when to use object detection and how to collect and label a custom dataset. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section down below, and let's get started! Before talking about training, it's important to draw the distinction between pre-trained and custom-trained models. The Yolvi Fire repo comes with a model pre-trained in the Coco dataset, which is a very popular dataset for benchmarking different object detectors. The Coco dataset contains 80 classes. Therefore, the pre-trained Yolvi Fire model can detect 80 different classes, including cars, buses, dogs, horses, spoons, knives, and many, many more. But what happens if we want to train a Yellow V5 model to detect objects that aren't included in one of those 80 classes? You might ask, can I just add more classes to a model pre-trained in the Coco dataset? And the answer is not really. Yellow V5 is a convolutional neural network. The insides of a neural network are very interconnected, and it's basically impossible to tell which exact neuron or convolutional filter is responsible for detecting a certain class. If you wanted to add a new class, say for car wheels, to a model pre-trained on the Coco dataset, you would need to go through all the 120,000 Coco images and label all instances of car wheels there. Plus, if you had any additional images, you would need to go through all of them to label the car wheels and all of the 80 Coco classes. Depending on the hardware, models usually take days or even weeks to train on datasets this large. Just adding a class to a pre-trained model means relabeling the dataset and retraining the model. If your goal is to make a model to detect car wheels, a much more viable approach would be to collect images of car wheels, label them, and train an object detection model with just one class. And that way you can still take advantage of the pre-trained Coco model in the context of transfer learning. Besides, if you still wanted to take advantage of the 80 pre-trained classes, nothing is stopping you from running two independent neural networks one after another, a pre-trained one and a custom one. However, sometimes it's better to train a single custom trained model. In part 2 I talked about a model that detects 4 classes, buses, their open or closed doors, and the bus numbers. This model is meant to run on the phone in real time, meaning that I couldn't afford slowing it down by running more than one network. Therefore I trained the model on just those 4 classes. How did I do that? Let's talk about training a custom model. Right now we're looking at a dataset I have collected. There are four classes, closed door, open door, bus, and bus number. This dataset has been uploaded to the cloud and has been visualized in the browser as a 1db table. 1db, or weights and biases, is a machine learning tools platform for experiment tracking and versioning and exploring data. Watch part 2 of the series to learn how we have collected and labeled the dataset and then uploaded it to Weights and Biases as an artifact. The cool thing about it is that we can easily download the dataset artifact we're looking at to train on any machine. In this video, I'll show you how to train a Yolo V5 model on Google Colab. You can follow along with me. Link to the Colab I'm showing is in the video description. We'll come back to weights and biases later to understand whether the model is actually learning anything successfully. In this call up, we'll run the first two cells to set things up and run a test inference. A quick reminder, we use that YAML files to let the YOLO V5 training script know where to take the images for training from, what the names of the classes are, how many classes there are, and so on. 
In part 2 of the series we use WMP artifacts, which is a tool for model and dataset versioning to upload our dataset to the cloud. You can watch part 0 to learn more about how WMP artifacts work. I'll also leave a link to the artifacts documentation in the video description. When we run the upload dataset script, like we did in part 2, it creates a special .yaml file that contains the path of the dataset as a link to the weights and biases artifact. We can then upload that file to Google Colab and pass it to the YOLO v5 training script, so it knows where to download the training data from. If you want to follow along, this cell generates the .yaml file that contains the link to the bus dataset that I'm using. Now we need to pass a few parameters to the train.py script inside the YOLOFI repo that initializes training. We'll pass the path to the .yaml file as a parameter, where its path is relative to the train.py file. We'll also specify a few other parameters, like the number of epochs to train for. During training, the dataset is split into mini batches. When the model trains in all the mini batches once, it completes one epoch. I typically initialize training with 30 epochs. The bbox manual parameter dictates once every how many epochs lag predictions and 16 random validation images to an interactive chart called Bounding Bugs Debugger. The save period parameter specifies once every how many epochs we would like to save the best checkpoint weights. In our case it's set to 1, meaning that we save the checkpoint weights for every epoch. After that we we'll specify the name of the WMB project that we would like to log the different training metrics, model checkpoints and evaluation artifacts to. I name mine custom YOLO V5. Even if you're training a custom YOLOV5 model, you still can and should use the weights of the pre-trained model for transfer learning. In a nutshell, transfer learning means starting training using a pre-trained model instead of initializing a YOLOV5 model and its weights completely randomly. If you're starting with a pre-trained model, you can save time because the model already knows the low-level features and can focus on adjusting the high-level ones. Transfer learning reliably speeds up training and improves accuracy. There are different sizes of pre-trained YOLO 5 models to choose from, small, medium, large and extra large. Intuitively, the smaller ones tend to be faster, while the larger ones tend to be more accurate. Here we'll pass weights YOLO 5 sdpt to use the smallest YOLO 5 model for training as baseline. Now we'll run this cell to start training. It'll prompt us to log into our Weights and Biases account or create a new one. Since I already have one, I'll copy and paste my API key. We can click on this link to open the Weights and Biases project we named Custom YOLO V5. In order to explain how weights and biases is useful, I'd like to paint a picture as to how I used to monitor training in the past. Basically, I would only have access to the metrics printed in the console. Then, after the model training was finished, I would download the model and run it locally and attempt to understand if it's actually learned anything successfully. That's the coolest part about the weights and biases tools. We can monitor and visualize training and validation performance of a model while it's training and easily compare the performance of multiple model variations. Plus, the weights are being logged every epoch, meaning that even if the call-up crashes, we're not wasting any progress. Now we're looking at the most important page of a YDB project, the project page. The left panel contains our runs, the instances of training our models. Every time we start a new training session, we'll see a new run appear on the left. The project page itself lets us easily compare the performance across multiple runs, side by side. For instance, here we can see how the different models are doing in terms of accuracy on the validation dataset. We can click on any run and open its run page, in order to study it more specifically. 
I will now show you how we can analyze the training process by looking at an identical model I've already trained. The most useful things we can look at here are the interactive training metrics, the bounding box debugger, and the evaluation artifact. Looking at the training metrics is relatively straightforward. We want the loss in the validation data to go down and the mean average precision to go up. Mean average precision, or MAP, is the way that accuracy is measured for object detectors. It measures how well the bounding box in their corresponding classes match the labels. However, machine learning is complex, and oftentimes just looking at the metrics might not tell us the whole picture. This is where we can start looking at the bounding box debugger. The bounding box debugger is a chart that shows us model predictions and 16 random images from the validation dataset. With bbox interval set to 1, it lacks these predictions every epoch. This chart is interactive, meaning that we can adjust the results for which epoch we want to look at, the confidence thresholds, and whether to display or not display certain classes. The third thing that we can look at, and my favorite, is the evaluation artifact. The evaluation artifact allows us to compare model predictions and ground truth on every image from the validation dataset for every epoch. We can find the evaluation artifact in the artifacts tab or even just on our dashboard. The evaluation artifact is visualized as a WineDB table, meaning that it's also interactive. Also note that the model predictions also display the confidence thresholds, unlike the ground truths. Now that our baseline has finished training, let's see if we can do better. I'll initialize the training again, but this time I'll use the large LV5 model and train for more epochs. This will take a few hours, and then we can compare the runs in the WNB dashboard. Let's select the last two runs we did, the baseline and the hopefully improved run. First, we'll look at the metrics in the validation dataset. We can see that the larger model outperforms the smaller one in terms of loss and accuracy. Then we'll look at the bounding box debugger and see how the two models perform on the same images. Finally, we can get the fullest picture by looking at the evaluation table. Here we can see the both models' predictions and ground truths for the entire validation dataset. WNB also tracks hyperparameters for each run, like batch size or the number of epochs. The best way to compare the hyperparameters is by using the runs table. Here we can append the hyperparameters we care about, like epochs, batch size, or the size of the YOLO V5 model we specified. Then we can collapse the runs table and be able to simultaneously see the performance of different runs and which hyperparameters they use to achieve that performance. If we have too many variations of hyperparameters to compare, we can group the categorical ones like say the model size or the number of epochs together and see the average performance of a specific group. Also, if we click on each run, we can find the cancel logs and in the artifacts tab on which dataset a given run was trained on. Mm -hmm. 
remember how we set the save period parameter to 1? WMB Luxin uploads the best weights of a model every pack, based on its performance in the validation dataset. In the project page we can click on a run, go into the artifacts tab and find the model artifact. There we can find that which pack the model had the best performing weights. There's another very important feature of the YOLO v5 and YDB integration to mention. The ability to resume crashed runs. Because our dataset and checkpoint weights have been locked to the cloud as WNB artifacts, if a run crashes, we can go into the runs overview panel, copy the run path, and pass it under the resume parameter to the train.py script to resume the crashed run. The cool thing is that training will continue from the very pocket left off. Charts for the crashed run begin to update as well. I talk about resuming runs in a little more detail in part 0 of this series. Now that we have trained a custom YOLV5 model, let's deploy it locally. We'll go into the Artifacts tab of the best performing run and find the model artifacts. Then we'll download the best.pt model and put it in the YOLOFI repo folder that we've installed locally in part 1 of the series. We'll rename it to bossmodel.pt and then open the console and run python, detect.py, sort0, weights, bossmodel.pt. This command starts the detection from my webcam feed. Let me point the camera at a second monitor that's showing bosses and see how it goes. This is a way of deploying the model to perform real-time detection via webcam. We can also run python detect.py source best video.mp4 weights bus model.pt to test the model's performance in a video. That's it for this video and for the YOLO V5 series. However, stay tuned for future videos and tutorials. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below and I'll be happy to answer them. And consider subscribing to our channel to see the upcoming videos. And thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful.